A very good evening to all. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome all the attendees to our yet another PG Examination Forum webinar. PG Examination Forum is the brainchild of Dr. Deepak Mishra sir, which was started with the goal to provide a unique platform for a academic discussion that would benefit Oxal residents across the country. We are currently a family of more than 1,400 PG residents on our WhatsApp group and over 700 on the Facebook. To become a member, all you need to do is to send your name and college name to the numbers provided on the screen. You can also join us on Facebook and subscribe us on YouTube so that you do not miss out any of our videos. We have successfully conducted 11 webinars so far and the response has been overwhelming. We have crossed 5,000 viewership for all our webinars. I would also like to add that all our special invitees today are residents from PG Examination Forum Group. I'm Dr. Saloni Sinha and I'm a postgraduate from MKCT Medical College Odisha. I'm pretty sure you'll agree that during our postgraduate journey, the most stressful time was some other final examination, while for others, it would be writing a paper, and for a few, it could be both. So here is an attempt to help us all through this webinar under the guidance of most elite experts from over the country who would be giving us tips and tricks so that we can give our best in our postgraduate examination. They would also be giving us insight about scientific writing to help us enhance our skills. Our chairpersons and speakers today need no introduction. They have been role models for all budding ophthalmologists and are all stalwarts of our field. It's my privilege to be welcoming them. Our chairperson for today is Dr. Rajvardhan Azad, sir. Sir is Professor Emeritus of Rio IGIMS Patna. He's also the chairman of University Service Commission Bihar. He has pioneered childhood blindness program, especially retinopathy of prematurity, and in the process, give vision to the future of India. Sir holds the post of Secretary of Sark Academy of Ophthalmology and is the most popular icon of young generation of ophthalmologists. We welcome you, sir. Now coming to our speakers for today, our first speaker is Dr. A.K. Khurana, sir. He is a pioneer in the field of ophthalmology. Sir is professor in STD Medical College, Guru Gram, and is the former senior professor and head of Rio PGIMS Rosa. Sir's books are famous among not only ophthalm residents, but undergraduates too. We all have read and passed our exam reading Sir's book. It is a pleasure to have you here, sir. Next we have Dr. Mangatram Dogra, sir. Sir is the Director of Retina Services at Krival Eye Institute, Chandigarh. Sir has done exemplary work on retinopathy of prematurity and has received many honors and awards for the same. He is the former professor and head of ophthalmology, Advanced Eye, Institute, uh, Eye Center, PGI Chandigarh. It is a privilege to have you here, sir. Next we have Dr. Meenakshi Swaminathan, ma'am. She is ex-senior consultant and academic director of Shankara Nitralay Chennai. And if you have attended any of lectures by ma'am in past, you would agree how beautifully she simplifies difficult topics like establishment. We are so pleased to have you here with us, ma'am. Next we have none other than Dr. Santosh Shunavar, sir. Sir is the director of Department of Ophthalmic Plastic Surgery and Ocular Oncology and National Retinoblastoma Foundation at Center for Sight Hyderabad. Sir is also the editor of Indian Journal of Ophthalmology and has achieved the unique distinction of being the first Indian ophthalmologist to receive the Life Achievement Honor Award, which is the highest award of American Academy of Ophthalmology conferred to its members. It is a privilege to have you here, sir. And our last speaker for the day is Dr. Vivek Gupta, sir. He is Associate Professor of Community Ophthalmology from RP Center, Ames, New Delhi. He would be enlightening us on a very important topic of PubMed research. We are happy to have you, sir. Now I would like to introduce our mentors. These are the people who are responsible for making these webinars possible. We have Dr. Satanshu Mathur, sir, who is Chairman of Scientific Committee Equine. Sir is also the founder of PG Examination Forum and National Convener, SSPC. Sir is the Secretary of NZOS and UK Source and owns uh, High Tech Eye Institute and Laser Center, Kashipur, Uttarakhand. And then we have Dr. Deepak Mishra, sir, Faculty at Regional Institute of Ophthalmology, BHU Varanasi. Sir is also the founder and admin of PG Examination Forum and chairman of Scientific Committee, UP Source, and also national convener at SSCC. Now, I, I would like to welcome Rajpardhan Azad, sir. He is here for the welcome speech. Today, we are really very happy after doing so many webinars, 
it is really proud privilege for me and for the PG forum that we have teachers of teachers in ophthalmology with us. Dr. Rajwad Ajaz sir, Dr. Mangat Dogra, Dr. Uh, Dr. Khurana sir, Santosh Anwar, Dr. Minakshi, they all are teachers and many of us teachers have taught many of our colleagues. So I will request Dr. Rajwad Ajaz sir, our chairperson to give the blessing to the PGs because they are going to appear in the exams. This PG, this webinar has been organized because of their request, because they were very worried what is good they will get, how will they give it, uh, they have the confidence to appear in the exam and get through. Dr. Rajwad Ajaz, can you hear me? Dr. Ajaz, sir, unmute kari apne go. You unmute yourself, sir. Yes, sir. Can you hear, yes, can you hear sir, me now? All the students. Yes. Thank you very much, Hatansu. And uh, I'm very happy to be here uh, among the students. It is always, you know, nice when I'm with the students because for so many years we have, you know, been in the teaching and uh, uh, my first love are the students only. Uh, this is a very unique uh, opportunity for the residents to listen to the great stalwarts in ophthalmology. Uh, as already mentioned, Dr. Ashok Khurana, everybody knows, and uh, he is, uh, you know, one of the very prolific teacher. He has taught uh, so many students and is a, a very good, uh, you know, uh, orator. Uh, we have uh, with us Dr. Mangar Dogra, and with whom I have very closely associated, not only uh, in the teaching, but also in the uh, you know, a special kind of retinal diseases. All of you know that is, uh, that is, uh, uh, you know, retinopathy of prematurity. And then uh, we have a battery of speakers, uh, Minachi, uh, you know, who is very, you know, uh, passionate about teaching. And we have uh, uh, Santosh, who is very positive about teaching. And uh, uh, then we have, uh, uh, Vivek, Vivek is also very, uh, you know, uh, Vivek, Vivek is also very, you know, enthusiastic about teaching and, uh, you know, the medical education. And the two guys, you know, Satansu and Deepak, they are very enthusiastic and very energetic, you know, in organizing such meetings. And this is very important, you know, kind of a session where, uh, the stalwarts in ophthalmology will deliver the lecture. What we are going to discuss in this particular session is, uh, you know, something about the theory. When you go to the examination, then what are the things which are important in the theory? You know, how do you how do you write? Uh, what is the what is the type of questions? Uh, you know, you have anatomy, physiology. You have the diagnosis. You have the uh, you know, the differential diagnosis and you have the management. So all these aspects, they are very important when you are discussing the theory. And especially, you know, if uh, you are, you know, writing about some particular disease, maybe you may get an essay type of question where you have to write about the, uh, you know, the, the, the clinical features, the etiology and the examination. How do you, what examinations you do? And then how do you arrive at diagnosis and, and so on and so forth. And when you are going for a oral examination or a practical examination, what we call, then we have, you know, various, uh, you know, uh, areas are there. Uh, like, you know, you go for the long cases and long cases, you may get a long case in a one particular, you know, uh, of ophthalmic disease. Then we, you have a short cases. The short cases are there. You have the instruments are there. The questions are mainly asked on the, instruments and also you have you know face to face with the examiner when you are facing the examiner what questions they are asking i can only tell you a very you know a very simple thing and that is the questions which are either put in the theory or the questions which are put which are kept for the practical or the viva examination they are all questions which you daily discuss. There is nothing out of blue. 
there is nothing which is which you don't know or there is nothing which you have not practiced during your residency program so you don't have to be tense don't be tense you know do your normal work don't get over stressed what people do they get over stressed and they you know read too much like especially when they are going for theory examination they read too many things and then ultimately when they go to examination hall they get confused and they get you know perturbed and all that so that is not the point at all when you go to the theory examination hall go with a free mind before before the night you know when you go for the uh, uh, when you when when you are going for the uh, theory exam just don't read anything one night don't read anything have a nice sleep go to the examination hall appear in examination hall write come back and then when you are going for an oral and practical examination you know keep yourself absolutely free just think what you have done when you were going for the rounds when you go for the rounds you discuss each and every case each and every case about the clinical picture what is the presentation what is the how do you, how did you examine how did you arrive at the diagnosis and what all you you know uh, supposed to know about that particular case and then you know you are the only one who are there for the management the first line of warrior you know like you know covid is there the first line of warrior who is the first line of warrior the first line of warrior are the junior residents the junior residents you know what type of case is this and how you have to deal and then the senior residents are there who are the basically the guides and the consultants like us we are there to help you to arrive at some conclusion and then you know if you are at some you know difficulty we try to solve your problem and then you can institute the treatment and of course you will see the what the result is so you don't have to go to anywhere you don't have to read too much you have to make up your mind organize yourself keep your mind fresh and then go, go for the examination this is my suggestions to all of you and uh, of course there is a battery of speakers here so i would uh, you know uh, like that uh, you know you hear their presentation they are all stalwarts they are all great teachers and they have been you know teaching in the in their institutions for a very long time i hope that this session will be a great and a big session and i have something in my mind which i will tell you not now maybe later sometime later thank you satanshu thank you uh, deepak and thank you all and thank you especially the intro for organizing this meeting thank you very much and you can go ahead with the presentation thank you very much thank you dada sir for speaking from heart i know that the students come in front of teacher teacher start speaking from the heart and unlimited time you can speak for the students so dr soloni yes sir so with my just dr sana uh, now i would like to request my fellow special invitee dr akansha to take over dr akansha thank you dr saloni i hope i am audible to everyone yes yeah. okay good evening everyone i am dr akansha resident in kgmc and i would welcome you all in this webinar we all know that exams are a part of getting through university unfortunately exams can trigger stress and a lot of anxiety for many students so today we have galaxy of speakers here who will be giving us insight about post graduate examination and scientific writing without much ado i would like to invite dr ak khurana sir to enlighten us about a very important topic that is how to prepare and fare in pg examination and overview over to you sir good evening everyone am i audible evening sir yes sir audible sir share the screen okay sir right, sir so good evening everyone good evening dr azad dr gra dr stanshu dr deepak mishra so first of all i congratulate the pg forum for organizing such a webinar and i convey my personal thanks for giving me chance to share my views right on how to prepare and fare in the pg examinations so i think by now mostly pg they have appeared in so many examinations and they must yes, know how to appear in the glare. examination however such share the skin 
Or you can speak from your heart. Yes. Is it okay? Okay, sir. Okay. So I shall be sharing my views on how to prepare and fare in PG examinations. So in fact, what I personally feel that our residents need to know how to fare in residency during these three years, because these are the three most important years of the training and their life through for, through which they will do well throughout their life. So the aim during residency should be to acquire good knowledge of the subject learn and master the diagnostic and management skills and be conversant with the digital technology and with this knowledge they should be able, able to reproduce in the examinations and not only this they should be able to become a competent clinician academician and a researcher in their life so what i want to say that this is just a lifestyle of the residents which i am going to tell them not the, any, any academic discussions so even before joining the residency, they need to gear up. That is, when their results are finalized, that they're going to be an ophthalmologist, going to join residency, they need to gear up th there and then. It is important to have a good head start in the residency because first impression is the last impression. So one should go through the basic ophthalmology books even before joining and start watching YouTube videos for various examination and investigative techniques which they are soon to perform. So, as a resident, it is very important to look. A well-groomed resident is always stands apart, and he needs to be polite with other staff. One can learn many things academically as well as ethically from this staff. So, this is a well-groomed resident. We want him to be well trimmed with haircuts, clean shaved, warm smile, and confident with formal dress and firmly handsome. So some basic rules to start studies during residency that you start with the basic books. So any resident who is through with anatomy and physiology always have an edge over others. Then case scenes in the OPD. Each case should be thoroughly studied on a day basis and then can be discussed with the seniors. Then basic examination skills, one should learn sleep examination, direct and indirect thermoscopy, and other things as quickly as possible. And one resident should be proactive to attending the emergencies because emergencies can provide perfect one-to-one -one learning from your seniors. So, so then a resident must know how to accept knowledge from the immediate seniors, which are the main source of the knowledge for them. So they need to create a good rapport with seniors. They can be your guide throughout life, not only for these three years. Then the residents should be inquisitive. They should not hesitate to ask any questions because inquisitiveness leads to questions and questions lead to answers and answer leads to a broader perspective in life. So be proactive, prepare a new topic daily and discuss with your seniors and get practical tips from their experience. Then the resident should join ophthalmological societies and teaching programs as early in the ophthalmic world. And they should join and attend various PG teaching programs to update their knowledge. They should join the surgical skill transfer courses because these provide a virtual hand of training to them. They must attend conferences and write articles from the very beginning. They can create their own identity in conferences from the very beginning. They can start making paper and poster presentations in the conferences. It will provide them an added confidence and recognition. They should be active in writing original articles and case reports. Dr. Hanawar is there today with us to tell them the art of his writing. Then if they follow the knowledge, the knowledge will automatically follow them. Then coming on to how to prepare for the examinations, the preparation of the examination basically is a continuous process throughout the residency. The art cannot be learned only at the 11th hours. So it is three years work which will help them. 
they need to have a structured plan for studies throughout the residency ideally it should be an integral part of the curriculum certain tips for continuous process of learning are they must set your goals determine your priorities plan yourself to follow the goals change your habits accordingly hard work during residency is the key to success in life then we need to overcome certain personal weaknesses which become a big obstacle in fulfilling our dreams and some of these common weaknesses of us include lack of goal setting lack of self discipline over socialization lack of proper prioritization procrastination poor communication and writing skill and last but not the least the lack of planning planning is the most important for every activity in life and those who fail to plan are sure the planning to fail make a plan for effective study during this period and learn how to attempt the theory papers i think professor mangad dogra is going to give the give them tips then they should learn how to perform well in the practical examination and dr minakshi will give the practical tips for this then the for effective study understanding is the key factor so always aim for understanding the subject rather than cramming Pro promote understanding by rearranging the material and linking it with the clinical aspects which you have observed and practically performed during your residency training and write and revise the important points frequently then what to study in your examination examination then questions from the last 10 year theory papers should be prepared thoroughly they should develop a plan for attempting these question by referring to the sample answers plan for attempting the question should include important key points to be covered flow charts illustrations etc then maintaining your motivation during exam days is most important so always think positive along with the hard work have self confidence and never underestimate yourself have good friend circle for group study as well as to boost up your mood when you are in under mood then meditation and yoga session are also useful to tide over the examination stress the key to success is to focus on goals and not on your obstacles on doubt it one should balance the work with play so they take frequent breaks during the study sessions as we all know the all work and no play makes the jack a dull boy then time management has its own role a good time management is essential both for theory as well as practical examinations and in general the time management is key to success not only for examinations but for every sphere of life so to conclude i will like to say that learning in medical sciences is a continuous process and so is the preparation for the examination but i will tell to residents that it is very easy to pass examinations so they need not worry rather it is difficult for the examiner to fail the candidates unless and until the exam candidate is bent upon then we all know the i see what the mind knows and the mind knows to what it is exposed so regular study observation and hands on practical work are the key ingredients to learn this science and art of medical practice what we have discussed are just broad outlines however each one of the resident have their own talent and own effective method to study and perform well in the examination hope these simple tips and suggestion should give you some added confidence to fare well in the examinations so take home essay the goal of residency training should not only to clear your exam pass the examination but to acquire good knowledge skills and attitude to a level appropriate to fare very well in the examination and after that practice independently right. as a an competent general ophthalmologist so best of luck to all the examinees and thank you very much for your patient here dr khurana sir yes. thanks a lot for this talk which is yes, you have touched very relevant point not only about the theory and practical but you have developed the personality of the student during the exams and that is very important that during the exam you should be you should have confidence 
and you should not lose your facility, whatever you have. So, moderator, we are going to sign next speaker. Thank you, sir. That was very informative and interesting presentation. Now, many of us have faced a situation where we have the knowledge about the topic, but are not able to pen it down on a paper properly. So, on this note, I would like to invite our next speaker, Dr. Mangat Ram Dogra, sir, for giving us some tips for theory examination. Over to you, sir. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Satan Mathur and Dr. Deepak for uh, giving me this opportunity to interact with uh, you. Uh, I think that is what uh, uh, I did lifelong. So are probably Professor Zad and Dr. Kurana here. I think we spent almost entire life doing this. Uh, but uh, one of the, uh, sorry, I think. Uh, uh, I think the topic which I got is, I think it's a difficult topic. I can hardly uh, really uh, tell you something that which uh, is going to be of a great help, but I'll try uh, giving few uh, practical tips as well as uh, talk to you uh, about uh, the experiences uh, which may be of interest to you. And uh, so basically, I think of what is very important and we must understand all of you must go through the curriculum in ophthalmology. And this curriculum in ophthalmology is uh, available once you go to, it's already on the M MCI, this thing, uh, websites, and you have all these seven things there mentioned right in the curriculum, right from the basic medical sciences to clinical ophthalmology, refraction, ophthalmic superspeciality, like you get posted through various clinics uh, uh, once you are there. And these basic sciences like ophthalmic uh, pathology, microbiology, biologic, uh, biochemical sciences, and also a community of filmology. And research, a part of that research, you also have a thesis, as well as, as uh, Dr. Konana was telling, that you uh, kind of get into that mode right in the beginning, and so that you can uh, sort of write some case reports or other things. And then, uh, what about the course content? Basically, the course contents, if you look at uh, the website there is, you have basic sciences. What uh, Dr. Kurana already mentioned, you start with the anatomy, physiology, you have biochemistry, you may have pharmacology, and you may have so many other biochemical uh, sciences these days. And optics in ophthalmology forms a huge uh, part. This one not only re includes refraction, but you use so many optical devices which you depend. So that's why it's so important. And of course, clinical ophthalmology goes all across, starting right from front, going to the back, and even up to the neuro-ophthalmology. So basically, at the, as far as the teaching in theory is concerned, I think uh, in the olden time, it was a ritual to have very specific theory lectures, which over a period of time is changing. And the lectures are still there. I think they are relevant they may be very important as far as the basic uh, lectures on some of the aspects are concerned. Then the demonstrations, are they are very, very essential because I think there are so many situations, especially all these investigative techniques where we have to learn uh, that it's only by demonstration. Then the seminars are somehow, I think these days going down and that's where probably the theory would be learned a lot. And also in symposia, in bigger hospitals, like from where like I was, Dr. Kurana, and of course with Sazad from uh, All India Institute, inter intra-departmental meetings, these are very important. I think we have interaction right from not only with the, the basic scientists like a pathologist, microbiologist coming in, as well as also pediatrician, radiologist. I think they take up and you have that kind of interaction happening. And general club is very, very important aspect to learn theory because that's where you're going to learn the recent uh, what is happening. And a, a participation in any of the CME programs or any of the conferences, that gives a lot of uh, uh, teaching to everyone. 
I think uh, this theory exam has usually four papers. And these four papers, they vary. I have seen um, the way they are mentioned. Uh, there could be one for basic science, another for clinical ophthalmology, maybe ophthalmic surgery and related topics or research advances. But at other places, they may be a little bit different. Uh, and they are not really uh, very much that it will be a category that if you have one paper, uh, the topic from other will not come. No, you will get topics from others also. They could be mix and match. So that you must always remember. As well as there may be some certain changes institutional-wise or sometimes it may be a little different. But usually four theory papers are uh, there for everybody and that is what one has to clear. Now, how to prepare for theory exam? That's where the board, uh, major thing is. I think books are essential for all residents. These days, somehow... They may not believe much in books, but believe in books. We have uh, Prince Karana here who has written the best of books. I think if you follow his book, you're never going to fail. And that's what. And use fewer and selected books. If you are going to learn from Dr. Karana's book or from a Yenov, you follow that book. Don't jump to many books. And that book should be followed very thoroughly right from beginning till end. That is what is very important. And I think we are all trained in reading books. This is a training we receive. <laughs> so don't follow the same practice. Don't uh, forget that we have to kind of change something. Dr. Kurana already said that we have to start with the basic first. Basics are very important. If you know the anatomy, physiology, the basics of the uh, optics, and basis of refraction and so many things, even basic investigative techniques. I think your job would become much easier. You would enjoy reading more as well as you would remember things more. So you need to have a regular daily routine of studies. Having a practical approach in ophthalmology, which Dr. Kurana also mentioned, is most important. Don't uh, cram the subject. It's not going to work. I think if you have a practical approach, what you see and you practice, that is what is going to be very, very important. And your peer group that matches you is the best company. I think they will always help you as well as they'll keep you motivated for reading, for doing things in life. And I think peer is the most important at any stage, right from childhood <coughs> also. So you need to study smartly. Not only what Dr. Grana said that you should be smartly dressed, but also you should know what is more important than others, as well as at the same time, don't leave out anything. If you leave, then it's a problem. And always have a schedule for completing your entire course. Start from beginning, as I said, in the beginning. And we always tend to give more time to practical and neglect theory paper. This is a big mistake. That's how many people suffer especially when I'll come to later on, especially in DNB, sometimes they take so long that they may not, uh, and even in some places now, what has started happening even in medical colleges, that they started sending papers somewhere else for checking, not with the examiner, those who are conducting your uh, exam that time. So everyday reading for the cases seen in the ward and OPD, already emphasized by Dr. Kurana, I think that is very, very important. If we're going to read about what we have seen and everything about that, and especially the aspects which we are, then you can correlate that and you'll never forget. In addition, read one chapter every day. Make a habit. So if you read one chapter every day, you will have the whole thing done. And you need to read all chapters. I mentioned that in the beginning. And last two months should be for revision. Don't leave the entire book for last two months. Then it is going to be a problem. I think definitely, I think this part also, Dr. Karana said, 10 years paper. Solve the previous year's exam papers for many years, as many as you can get. You will find that minimum 30 to 40% questions are repeated. Because these are important topics. They are bound to be repeated because we want to examine you on common things which are day-to-day -day problem. So that's how it helps also. Remember, there are no shortcuts. As I already mentioned to you, you 
need to follow a particular book, go from right from beginning till end, and don't keep on switching from one book to another. You will have a problem. You will get totally confused. You will do more harm. And you need to jot down or underline or highlight the key points for revision. It's very important sometimes. If you have done that, you can quickly revise. Otherwise, you will have to go through each and everything. And focus on weak areas. Why I mentioned optics and refraction? Because we, this is all neglected by everybody. And then we don't understand. You know, refraction still forms the major chunk of the practice of uh, ophthalmic uh, ophthalmology. And so are the optics. You see, most of the equipment which we use has got optics. And you need to kind of go through that very, very carefully. And standard pres prescribed books are the most important reading material. Remember that. If you read the book, that is going to be more helpful rather than present generation only going to Google. They're just going to Google the, uh, whatever the topic and they want to look at that. You won't get entire information the way you would like to have it right from the basic all the way to what is happening now. That is from the book. And journals and review articles, of course, they do help. And uh, there are problems at this time. I have seen this myself and I get very worried because we being mostly educationists, there is a lack of dedicated, inspiring and well-informed teachers in many peripheral colleges. And it's not their fault because they are now sort of getting outdated because they don't get uh, updated. There are many places they have, they don't have a FACO. There are many places they don't even know how to do an examination with an indirect of filmoscopy. I'm a retina person. I go to many medical colleges. So they have never done that. So what I mean to say is there is a lack of uh, practical skills and knowledge uh, in various centers. For that, we need to, to create a situation, more resource center, as well as professional development programs so that we can have all of them trained. I have even gone to places for a sort of doing inspection or a survey where teachers feel very sorry that they have not seen many of the things or they have don't know many things which are uh, very important these days. And there are, of course, issues with the resident also. Resident is exposed to so much of information. They are not only confused, they also want everything to be done, which is not possible. You see, in our country, there's a resource constraint. So focused motivation may be lacking. They may be interested in something which, in fact, may not be of importance. That is where the problem lies. I think if they go back to the basics and then study everything, and after that they go into, then that is what is very important. And shortcuts are applied most of the time. They may be just interested, I just want to do cataract surgery and I'll be fine. They'll not even look at, they don't even know that what are the complications, what are the consequences, how to manage. So shortcuts are not. And that is what the problem is also at this time, which we need to sort of uh, take out. And time management is very important. It is highly uh, this thing that we should be organized and disciplined and ensure you take out enough time for preparation, revision, as well as relaxation. I think this part, relaxation, uh, Professor Kurana also mentioned, because that is also a very, very important aspect. In addition, have time for clearing your doubts with your core group. Your seniors, he mentioned about senior residents. He mentioned about the faculty, immediate seniors. You see, you learn so much from everybody. If you have that kind of a group, which is vibrant, you're going to be learning much more. There are little differences between DNB as well as MDMS, and I'm sure both kind of residents are there. DNB students may be better exposed to latest equipment and practices than MDMS because many of the colleges uh, in the setup, maybe in the peripheral medical college, they don't have everything available. But they have certain advantages. They have structured training, uh, teaching program. They have those trained teachers, which uh, in fact impart good education to them, although they may not have all the equipment. And proper faculty may not be sometimes available for DMB students. You might, they might have more people, those who are more interested in doing surgery or may not be uh, having teaching experience at all, that can happen. And teaching and training for both varies according to the place and institution. So we have institution, in fact, 
I think that we've been DNB examiner to this Quran Ami for many, many years, up north, south, everywhere, then we understand. If they come from very good institutions, and I, I don't need to name them, I think we, I, myself, I have seen 100% result. Although it never happens, I have written here 40 to 60%, and in some subjects it is still about 15 to uh, 30%. So it is possible because I think good institutions would totally be different. So DNB is a problem in a way that theory is given much more uh, weightage. Like why I mentioned here, you have to have 400, 100 each paper, 100 marks each paper, and you get 200. And in practically only 300 marks are given for that, which doesn't happen in MDMF. That is different there. You may have mostly more weightage for practical as compared to theory or sometimes it is 50-50 that is variable. So the DNB entry may be easy, but exit is a problem. That's where the issue sometimes happens. And MD is the other way around. I think the entry may be difficult, MD, MS, but exit is relatively easy because the exam is held only at that place. And in DNB, you go to a different center. So what are the tips uh, to crack exam? You need to scan the question paper very carefully. Read each question and think how much time for each question is required. This is very important. If you don't have a time frame in mind, it's going to be a problem. Whether you need for some kind of a shorter notes, just about uh, say five minutes, seven minutes, 10 or 15, mostly like we have 10 questions. Or you may have sometimes bigger questions and small notes. So you must have that time frame and make a list of things asked in the question. Sometimes there are three things asked. And you divide those marks, suppose it is 10 marks, and you keep on spending only on etiopathogenesis so much of time, and it is, that is hardly two or three marks. That doesn't work. And select and attempt easy question first. That I feel is important because that builds your confidence. And first solve the question with more marks. If the question has more marks, you tend to solve that. And divide that, as I said, different areas in that. And you must attempt these questions quickly because you know them and that will build the confidence. And this approach, according to me, may be better than going just in an order because sometimes you get into a situation where a difficult question is there, you are not knowing, then you waste time and then it's a problem. And you need to definitely, definitely uh, attempt most of the questions. That's very, very important or, or all questions. I think I need to emphasize this point. Always make a neat diagram wherever possible. There are many. In anatomy, you may get development of a lens. You may get blood supply of optic nerve. Superior orbital fissure. Just make a diagram, label it, you are done, and you'll get full mark. And same way, you may have optics of indirect ophthalmoscopy. If you just make a nice diagram, you are done. That is what is very important. Label it nicely. The flow charts, wherever possible, flow charts are very important. That give the gist as we manage particular condition and enumerate points. There are so many, like if you are talking about complications or you are talking of various therapy, you can enumerate them very boldly. One, two, three, four, five, six. That is nobody is reading line by line. That is what is important. But if there are these points which are highlighted, underlined, are clearly written, our diagrams are there, you're going to definitely not only pass, but pass with fine colors. Like I'll give you some example, to steer polar cataract, if it comes to you in the exam, what do you do? So what are the important aspects here? Isn't, isn't it? If you don't know about that, why the posterior polar cataract occurs and what is the complication, I think that is going to be the crux of problem. Same with post-op end of filmitis, which is so, so common. If you are not knowing that what you're going to immediately do in such a situation, and if you don't write that, it's not going to work. Diabetic macular edema. This may be asked every time. There will be a question on diabetes all the time. May not macular edema being the commonest thing. Now, you have to know very thoroughly and also write the salient points about diabetic macular edema. These days, I put up just an OCT angiography here or an OCT maximum number. Everybody is carrying this. 
So you need to learn about these things. My favorite subject, retinopathy of prematurity. You may be asked just classification of retinopathy. Of prematurity. You need to make a neat diagram, label it, and put those stages. You or you may be asked management of a retinopathy of prematurity. So you see these things. You can answer very well if you are clear in your mind and you are to the point. <laughs> Same way, here's a gas put in a retinal detachment case. You may be just ask about sulfur hexafluoride gas. So, I mean, you should know about it, that how much uh, this expands, what is expensile and non-expensile, and where you use it. So, that kind of a thing should be there. So, in the end, I would like to just finish my talk here that how to attempt the theory paper is, as I said, you must attempt all the questions after you have gone through each question very carefully. Avoid long answers. Be to the point and attempt it in a concise form. I already said, if you can make diagram, enumerate the points and highlight them and all aspects need to be brought out. Depends upon, I told you, divide. The question may have um, four components in the description sometime. It is a long question. Then you need to divide because each thing may have just two or three points, uh, numbers giving you. And the salient and the most important aspect should never be missed. Always, as I said, I said that if you don't write the complication in a posterior polar cataract, that why and how much you have a posterior capsular rupture and how you prevent it, I think it's not going to get marks. So thank you, friends. And uh, I hope it will help you a little bit somewhere. But it's a difficult topic and say something in a theory, which is always a tricky situation. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Dr. Dogra, sir, you have made this difficult topic very easy to understand. You have right, very right, such a crucial point. The teachers are very intelligent. By just seeing your two or three lines, they know your knowledge status. Don't try to make a fool of the teacher. If you made a diagram, if you made a diagram, if you made the flow chart, teacher knows that you have the complete knowledge of the subject. So this is a very important thing. So you have done justice to your part, sir. They are respecting it and more than this. And second thing, way of your talking, way of your teaching, we put the confidence in our students. Deepak. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you sir. I'm sure residents will benefit from the methods you suggested. So if theory exams make us shiver, then practical exams almost give us a nightmare. For students like us, we suffer from verbal blackouts in Viva exam. So on this note, I would like to invite our next speaker, Dr. Nakshi Swaminathan, ma'am, who will be talking about some practical pearls for the practical exam. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much. And Sanshu, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Deepak. I feel very honored to be here in the company of uh, esteemed teachers and friends. Uh, I trained. Uh, at PGI, so I feel very special to share the stage with Dr. Mangal. Um, so uh, originally I was told this is about 30 minutes, but uh, and I was it was clarified that it's a little less. So I request the moderator to ask me to wind up if I seem to be overshooting the time. Um, so what I, uh, how I have designed this, let me tell you. Uh, I have experience being a DNB examiner and a DO examiner. We have just got MS from uh, in Shankaryatralia, but I have been through an MS course. So uh, I know where typically people get stuck. And uh, I have come out, I have had PGs come out and say, oh, I wish I had prepared better. So I'm just going to take you through a mock practical exam. So this is you, students out there. Hello. Now, this is you entering for your practical exam, okay? So here we go. So yes, practice makes perfect. And I saw this lovely thing which says there are five study hacks, but in which I will point out that one of my favorite way in preparing for answering, especially if you're a shy person, is to say it aloud. When you say something aloud, you hear it also, and it reinforces things. Reward yourself. Why not? If you've finished a particularly tough chapter, get yourself a bar of chocolate. And uh, 
teach to be taught. It's my favorite thing. So you form, if you form little study groups for preparing for a exam, for the practical exam especially, one becomes a mock examiner and the other becomes uh, the student. And so you start asking questions. So teach to be taught again is, a, I think, a great uh, uh, tool. Now, let me start off at the outset by sharing resources. And this is the list that I took from students who have attempted the exam, who have passed the exam. And they told me uh, Arvind book of FAQs, Dr. Namrata Sharma's book of cases, website mrcoft.com, particularly through us pages, review of ophthalmology. And of course, here we have esteemed Dr. Kurana's books, which are extremely comprehensive, particularly the refraction book and uh, the AAO preferred practice pattern, which, is, uh, which are PDFs available for free. These should be a good list for you to prepare specifically for the practical exam. So without delay, let's start off with clinical cases. Now, sometimes you will get one long case, one short case, one fundus case, and one refraction. In some exams, in like DNB, it is three 20-minute cases, anterior segment, posterior segment, and a mixed bag, and a refraction case. So it, sometimes the format varies from uh, every year to year, and whether you're an MS or a DNB course. So if I were you, I would be prepared for long case, but quickly summarize in a short case. And if you're asked to say, doctor, give me the diagnosis, then you should be able to say that in one line as well. Okay, by the time the afternoon rolls around, the examiners are tired. And so they may just say, okay, tell me what, uh, summarize your findings. So you should be able to quickly summarize things you know, without uh, feel, feeling like you're stumbling. So, um, so I'm, I'm presenting a case of anterior segment mixed bag. Maybe uh, you have a, the history is a 75 year old engineer, presence with progressive drooping of eyelids since two years, and what could be the causes and what are the history would you ask? Maybe the questions that you'll be asked. So the first thing I'm gonna say is do not commit to a number and let me tell you what I mean by this. Here is a patient and you, can, you know that you're going to need to ask certain questions and tell certain findings. If they ask you what could be the causes, don't say um, the causes of ptosis at this age are five and then you're stuck after three. So never come to a number, just start enumerating from the commonest. Pearl number two, don't beat around the bush. For example, when I showed this in a mock viva the other day to my students, I said, can you describe? He says, uh, there is no abnormal head posture. There is no facial asymmetry. Where can you really see all this in this picture? You can't even see. So don't beat around the bush, but be systematic. In the sense, you, if in a patient with ptosis, you have to mention the pupils, you have to talk about the EOMs. So you make sure all those are systematically presented. For example, in this case, you're going to have to say, lid crease, MRD 1 and 2, LPS action, lack of thalamus, Bell's phenomenon, extraocular motility, pupils. I'm, I'm going to wait and see whether you're going to talk about the Kogan's Litwit sign, whether you're thinking of myasthenia as cause of an acquired uh, ptosis. I'm, as an examiner, we'll be waiting for it. So pearl number three, be ready for lateral thinking. And what I mean by that is, your examiner asks for describing a case of ptosis may suddenly jump and say, what is the relationship between ptosis and uh, ocular motility? And taking you in the direction of a third nerve, maybe, uh, and so they'll say, what is the relationship between uh, ptosis and uh, pupils? And taking you in the direction of honor syndrome. And then maybe the whole thing will move into the realm of neuroophthalmology and they'll start asking you to trace the uh, honor's sympathetic pathway. So you never know when the exam will be, uh, where will he be going. So be ready for lateral thinking. Now moving on to a fundus case, most important thing is to be systematic. So as you know, you start, uh, as you would do in your ward rounds, you start about uh, talking about the media, then the disc description, and then the vessels, and then the uh, posterior pole, and what you see outside the arcades. And then sometimes you're not sure. So you, and, and what happens is there's sometimes a long gap between theory and practical. So, and, uh, and by the time you've actually even finished your course, it's so important to practice with an atlas and rehearse with a friend, especially for fundus cases. Open a fundus atlas and start talking about what you're seeing in front of you, case after case after case. And ask your friend to quiz you. The pearl number five is if you have seen this case, you're not sure what it is, you've just blanked out, um, offer a differential diagnosis. Tell them, can I tell the examiner? Uh, 
may I say a differential diagnosis and, and no examiner is going to say no. He's going to say, okay, go ahead. What is the probable cause? Then you can say, I see subretinal exudation. And then you can come up with one or two, three causes of subretinal exudation. You may miss the quotes, uh, you know, as, the, uh, as, as a bang diagnosis, but it's okay. Sometimes you're nervous in the exam. Sometimes it may be little atypical. It's good to go with a differential diagnosis. That way the, the, the examiner knows that you know how to put things together, how to think. So, number six is... Practice the anterior segment case with a color-coded drawing. Practice drawing fundus with an AMSLIS chart with a color code. It is, if you get a retina person as an examiner and you draw there with a tiny little bangle, one tiny circle, and you're shy, trying to show all your findings with that, they're not going to be happy. Sometimes they will just hand you the AMSLIS chart and see whether you know even how to place the chart. If you place the chart correctly, the examiner will usually immediately know that you know what you're doing. So if you can practice drawing with Amsler's chart. For example, they may suddenly throw a, a, you know, something at you which says, okay, what is the Shields classification of Coates disease? I had to put, in, put this in there because Honavar is a co-author. Anyway, jokes apart. So they may just throw something at you and you may be caught off guard. And so the, the pearl there, I don't know why the pearl didn't come. The pearl there is, of course, if you don't know, say you don't know, okay? So don't try to guess. These are all very clear classifications. Just say, I don't know. And then usually they will move on to the next topic. Refraction. When you move to refraction, you will usually always be asked optical cross. Remember drug correction. You may be asked all about the cycloplegics. Contact lenses and optics of instruments actually comes under refraction. So please know them, prepare them well for the refraction station. It may be something as simple as can you do transposition of the following? It may be an examiner is tired by afternoon. He's taken your paper. He's looked at your refraction value. He knows you're right. But, or maybe somebody whispered it in your ear. I don't know. So he will push something and say, can you do transposition? Why is it important, doctor? Um, and there, the refraction station went very well. Now we're going to go to the table viva. Okay. Now I'm going to cover really every aspect of the table viva very quickly. So again, preparation is the key. And this is not preparation between your theory and the practicals or one week before the practical. This is preparation throughout your course. If you have been a diligent student and have looked at instruments, drugs, and investigations throughout your course, remember this is usually a breeze. So in recent advances section, you may be asked something as, what are recent advances in the treatment of capillary hemangioma and an infant in the last five years? Straightforward answer, but they may catch you by saying, what is the dosage? Or it may be as recent as Jan 2020, what is the optic trial that was published? So the pearl here is that, where do you read recent advances from? Good sources, IGO, the DOS journal, the state society journals also very often have very good recent advances, um, uh, write-ups. The AIOS proceedings, believe it or not, is a great resource. It has excellent videos from every session of the AIOS of which recent advances, in fact, it's going on. Recent advances in glaucoma is currently being sent to us by uh, Dr. Aru. So community ophthalmology. It may be as simple as classification of vitamin A deficiency, a piece of cake, or it may be something like an NGO wants you to conduct a surgical camp in their village. How will you go about it? Maybe they're trying to trick you. They, they want you to know what are the rules. So if you don't know, like I said, say so uh, and move on. So moving on to the, there is one segment called basic science. Again, it may be something like describe attachments of the orbital septum, but be prepared to draw. They might just shove a paper on, in front of you and say, go ahead and draw it, doctor. So don't think drawing is over with theory paper. It may feature in practicals also. Surgical instruments. First, uh, very often either they will hand you one or you, they will ask, ask you to pick one. Okay? So in your mind, be prepared which instrument you would pick, either in the oculoplastic tray or from the antisecond tray, typically. Thankfully, they don't keep many VR instruments. And uh, strabismus is anyway only a muscle hook, so it's okay. So you have to first identify, use the proper noun. You say this is kerisons, bone, punch, or bone, wrong ear, or whatever you want to say. And Following that, usually you are asked a question in relation to that. Like, for example, it will be compare and contrast endonasal with external DCR. Maybe the question that will follow this. So the pearl here is, 
generally don't contradict the examiner with vehemence the examiner may say if from you but usually be respectful and just say what you have to say and keep quiet don't get into an argument drugs typically again usually are very straightforward uh, you have to know the pharmacological name a uh, percentage dilution root dose mechanism of action indication contraindications side effects you have to know this for every drug that you encounter in ophthalmology and the best way is throughout your pg just rehearse it quickly moving on to radiology radiology i put radiology here but this is true of all investigations so you may be shown a plate like this or you may be shown an image on a laptop don't start talking immediately is the pearl first spend a few seconds looking at the image studying it systematically and then start talking for example i uh, we did a mock viva the other day and uh, i said you know go ahead tell me what's going on here and uh, one of the people i was doing the mock viva with you know what uh, that person said i think there is a bony uh, you know expansion of the zygomatic bone i think there is maybe a bony tumor this person completely missed the flow fracture now that is a serious serious mistake so the, the the trick here is be systematic in your description if you have if you have trained yourself to be systematic like talking say i think this is a ct scan a coronal cut at the level of you know mid level of the orbit i can still see the globe patient is slightly tilted because the orb, the eyeballs are a different size and then if you go systematically you won't make silly mistakes so very important to read any scan investigation oct uh, whatever it may be systematically next you will be asked opd instruments it's not uncommon maybe something like this you may be asked even the variants you may be asked where will you position this etc etc microbiology you what you have to do is describe the stain the you or identify the organism you have to know about the media for culture the infection that it causes in the eye other and uh, uh, other organisms in the class like for example i asked the other day so what are the other gram negative bacilli and there was a complete blank please at least say pseudomonas okay and you have to know antibiotic susceptibility of all this come on i mean eye infections are so few really you have to at least know them really well pathology first identify the tissue again there is no shortcut for this you have to look at ocular pathology uh, you know atlases see in when i was a student that's all you had you had a few textbooks you have so much resource on the internet for every for a you know for a basal, basal cell carcinoma there are you know 25 30 images out there of of every uh, you know type for morphia for whatever it is so please use that and you again have to do a systematic description and make sure you say the important findings like you know you you have it is not complete unless you say peripheral palisading in this case and important the other day i showed this again to a student and he said that starts off by saying there is a big vacuole and uh, i said god how am i going to help them so the, beware of artifacts as well so again be systematic and i said practice with an atlas ward rounds ward rounds may be an actual patient or it may be an image if they not covered ground in other uh, segments they will use the ward rounds for this they may you know show you something like this and lead you on to trials so know your trials and the best way to know the trials is to quiz each other surgical techniques when they come to surgical techniques the examiner may show an, a diagram or may show play a video or it may just be questions like example what are the choices of surgery in congenital ptosis describe the steps of the lps resection because they want to know whether you have actually even seen these surgeries now if you look the pearl here is look at the number of webinars that we have had you know a plethora a bouquet of webinars there are so many youtube videos wonderful videos i know dr santosh videos are there up there wonderful videos aios aios proceeding videos are there so please go through surgical uh, videos i never saw this during my pg i never saw this procedure is not an excuse when you have so many resources out there so i think i have given you a, a bouquet of pearls here i mean i've given you a pearl garland a necklace of pearls and i think if you follow some of these tips you are going to just ace the exam but there are no shortcuts no quick fixes no blaming others no i'll do it tomorrow really no excuses 
Uh, I want to introduce snippets. Dr. Deepak Mishra has been kind to share this uh, with uh, in the Facebook page. This is available on Spotify and Google Podcast. This is a podcast initiative from Shankar Netralaya. It comes once a week. It's only 10 minutes to listen to it on the go when you're doing your walk. Uh, we have covered uh, COVID for ophthalmologists, uh, congenital cataracts, as well as keratoconus, and digital eye strain, and um, this next episode. I, and I have covered on how to ace PG exams. And the next one is going to be on, uh, you know, history of ophthalmology, very cute snippets. So I look forward to your uh, listening and giving your feedback and making use of it. With that, I thank you once again. Happy to help any of you. Please write to me at drms at smu.org. Thank you once again for this opportunity. Best wishes. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for the thought-provoking tips. As much as conquering our exams are important, so is overall molding of our career as a budding ophthalmologist, in which writing and publishing an article forms a major role. For which who can tell us better than someone who is himself an editor of the most esteemed journal of our country. Hence, I would like to invite Dr. Santosh Navasar, who is going to deliver a talk on manuscript cycle at IGO, What an Author Must Know. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much. In the next 15 uh, minutes or so, I'd like to cover what happens behind the scenes after you submit a manuscript to IGO for, for that matter, any, any journal for that matter. You know, journal processes nearly remain the same. But before we go forward, why should you publish at all? You know, what business does a resident have to publish? Publication is mainly for the faculty. That's what we think. But publication is extremely important for a resident for several reasons. One of which is that a selfish reason is that your CV becomes stronger. These days, you don't stop at residency and you really want to progress on to do fellowship, Indian or international. And if two people are exactly similar in terms of, say, a fellowship exam scores or the, you have fared equally well in the interview, the differentiator between two equally well poised individuals otherwise is a publication. So one publication can tip the balance in your favor if you have it. And if you don't have it, the person who has it will get the advantage. That is one. Second is that if you want to apply for an international fellowship or even if you want to apply for an ICO fellowship, which is a funded three-month international fellowship, if your CV is strong and it has a few publications sprinkled somewhere, then it's always a good. You get an advantage. So that's a fair advantage. The third important reason is that during residency, you see a lot of good cases. And if you have a documentation, if you have a mindset to document every good case that you see and write it up, then that is actually a very good thing because that helps you in your studies as well. You become very systematic that way. And one of these cases that you're documented might become published. And in fact, if you have a grand round in your own medical college, and if you have a very beautiful case that is presented in the grand round by you, then it, you might as well write it up. Even if it doesn't get published in a major journal, it may see light in a national or a state journal. So it's always a good idea to write up things. So this is the editorial process that happens. Whenever somebody submits a manuscript online, it goes for an editorial review, then goes for production, and then goes for publication. So this is the first part of the editorial review, where there is something called a quality check. So when a manuscript is uh, submitted, editors and their team examine the manuscript. They see it very much in detail, look at the language, look at the formatting, look at whether the manuscript is complete or not. Is it missing an abstract, length or word count? For example, if you have a case report, you can't go beyond 800 or 1000 words or whatever the general prescribes. Scope, if you have a totally experimental study sent to a clinical journal, then uh, it may not stand a chance. Similarly, if it's a research journal and if you see a send up purely clinical stuff, it also may not stand a chance. Is the article type correct? Have you submitted a case report under the section of case report or have you submitted it to the original article? What is the significance? Is this a simple run of the mill case or does it have some kind of a teaching point? And what do the readership want and what impact would your article have? So these are the factors that are taken into consideration in the initial screening. If a particular manuscript does not satisfy most of these, 
then the manuscript is rejected at the phase of submission itself so within a week or 10 days if you hear from the journal that your manuscript is rejected that means that it was rejected last largely based on the screening criteria the priorities for that particular journal and it has not undergone a due peer review process suppose some of these factors are missing and the manuscript is alterable it can be modified then it is sent back to the author for alteration so that is called a technical revision or a technical review so technical editor will screen the manuscript and send it back to the author saying that you need to correct your references you need to put your results in this particular way your graph should be like this your table should be like this all that has to be achieved before it goes to the peer reviewers because peer reviewers have very limited time they are the most scarce resource in in medicine or ophthalmology or any scientific publication process they have very limited time and you cannot bother them with a full stop missing there or a comma missing there they have to be given a manuscript in a particular accessible format so a baseline review always aims to ensure as far as possible that a manuscript is given to the reviewers or presented to the reviewers in a format that they can easily access it so once it reaches a stage for a peer review it is sent for a peer review so this is what the initial screening phase is this happens in the first 3 or 4 days so this is this is when i log in this is what i see how many are in editorial review what category in how many manuscripts are waiting for a decision how many are waiting for a revision how many have been rejected over the last one year how many are under technical modification so this is my kind of a opening screen that i see and here i choose whatever that i want to work on or any editor for that matter whoever wants to work on a particular aspect they would choose it and go forward that's just the close up of the screen now uh, once it passes the technical screening as i said baseline scientific review is performed by an assistant editor in iju now this is again by an assistant editor who is a very young individual he is at the lowest level of a faculty assistant editor assistant professor or a lecturer or somebody who is even a senior resident for that matter who is competent in assessing an article he does a baseline scientific review just to make sure that the article is optimized before it is sent for peer review now if you think peer reviewers are very cruel they they want to bash you up for every small mistake you may or may not have done that is very wrong peer reviewers actually are some of us they are peer review is an evaluation of work by one or more people with similar competence to the producers of the work that means that your own friends and colleagues may be reviewing your work without them or you knowing that they are reviewing your work because it is double blinded in most of the journals so if i get an article written by my own friend i can possibly guess based on the case profile but i cannot confirm whether it is written by him or her because i i would do know who whose manuscript i am reviewing similarly the author will not know that i have reviewed so it is a double blinded kind of a review so nobody will be unduly critical towards your work because they don't know who you are there is no personal bias involved or ideally it should not be involved at all it is a form of self regulation basically in science self regulation is very important so if your peers are equally competent as you are they will be able to tell whether a particular article maintains quality can it be improved further and is the work credible or not so the purpose of peer review is very only as as i would say you know it assesses the suitability for publication is the work true credible is it reproducible is it important and relevant to the journal and its readers is the work communicated effectively is there an element of novelty to it is there any plagiarism it also would help you improve the manuscript because they will comment on how to interpret results in a optimal way how to reason out the discussion how to present the results in a much better way you'll get critical but constructive feedback and also some new and additional ideas at the stage of peer review so how are peer reviewers chosen 
we have a huge database of peer reviewers whenever somebody's manuscript gets accepted that particular person also gets added to the bank of peer reviewers because he has written an article and it is accepted so he has some standing in the publication world so he gets added so similarly we keep on adding good reviewers all through the year and we have a big database but we don't preclude the authors from suggesting reviewers sometimes it so happens that authors may have written on a particular rare disease which general or regular peer reviewers may not have some experience with so authors can actually suggest the names of two or three peer reviewers that is perfectly acceptable we may or may not send it to them but authors can suggest it as part of the submission process we can also accept peer reviewers as suggested by other reviewers for example i send an article to meenakshi and she says that no i don't think i would be able to review it but i have one more colleague of mine who may be able to review it that is from a suggestion of a reviewer that is fine reviewers may also be suggested by editorial board members and our own knowledge of the community now this is a reviewers score sheet or a questionnaire it asks several questions does the manuscript contain new and significant information is the problem significant and concisely stated are the experimental and theoretical methods described comprehensively interpretation and conclusion justified by the results which is very important is the abstract concise is the literature citations adequate is the language acceptable reviewer is supposed to answer as yes no and may even give a detailed description he'll say see report then finally he will give either accept minor revision major revision or rejection as the result so peer reviewer is asked to comment on whether the article should be accepted whether it should be modified whether it should be rejected acceptance without modification is extremely extremely rare you won't generally want to accept an article without even a minor modification so it's very rare so majority of manuscripts go for a major revision or a minor revision in fact major revision is more about 60% of revision articles go for a major revision which means that it will be reassessed major revision will also mean that it will go back to the same reviewers for reassessment whereas with minor revision the editor or the editorial board member or the section editor has the independence to accept it once it is re revised so there is no for no need for a second review so when a article comes back to you or the author for a revision you have to look at the reviewers comments very very carefully you have to be nice to them when you respond to them you should thank them for positive comments for negative comments you should accept their views where views can differ and try to explain it very politely don't take a kind of a confrontation confrontationalist attitude towards the reviewer because they haven't harmed you their intention is not that they may have used some rough language that is individual but then their intention is not to harm you or hurt you it is just to point out mistakes or being critical so you take it as it is at face value and respond to it very gently as gentle as you can be but making your point loud and clear so your point should be loud and clear but the language that you use should be quite gentle apologetic wherever that is required and thankful wherever that is required so because your responses will go back to the reviewers and if you are confrontational as they might take it in a negative sense and that may lead to multiple sessions of review and re review and your manuscript publication may unduly get delayed so you need to convince them and generally not the editor if the reviewers are convinced that your manuscript is good then editor has to simply accept it he doesn't have any much role no some manuscripts are rejected which is unfortunate but true in fact 50 60% of manuscripts may be actually rejected in some journals it is even 90% 98% but when a manuscript is rejected do you actually counter it generally not generally if it is based on a sound reasoning why it is rejected you don't go back and fight with the editor or the editorial board occasionally but if you think that you know comments are not justified they are biased etc then you uh, can appeal to the editorial board for a re review which is very rare so why do manuscripts get rejected what are the problems so all that is shown in red are the most frequent reasons poorly written manuscript your work may be good but writing may be very poor 
inadequate, inadequate or inappropriate way of presenting. It means you're very repetitive, data is all haywire, there is no organized way of presentation. Very poor description of the design, that means make, making it very difficult to reproduce. Some of this is extensive zeal and self-promotion, that means that, that this is the first ever case in the world of this particular disease, which may not be true. You may not have done your literature search carefully, so you should not be very, you know, um, you should not self-promote yourself, you should not self quote your own articles too many out of 20 articles that you have quoted, if 15 are yours, then that is self-promotion. And if you're confused or contradictory, your results say something, but your conclusion says something else, your discussion says totally different thing, that is confused way of presenting your results and discussion. So that is also one of the reasons for rejection. And if the uh, reviewers feel that essential data is omitted or doctored or ignored, that means that you're not talked about your complications. You have only talked about the positive aspects of the study, hidden all the complications behind. You don't want to talk about it. That is something that is negative. If it's very boring, you don't make any point at all at the end of the manuscript. That is again something that is considered negative. And if you ignore important work of others, if you don't cite it, also that is considered negative. Most important reason for rejection, of course, is plagiarism. So we have a built-in software in IGO for any journal in that matter, for that matter. You can actually upload that particular article on a software called iAuthenticate or anything, some, something similar. And sometimes you'll be surprised to find that the plagiarism index is 48%. That means that 48% of this particular manuscript was copied from other sources, which is very bad. You know, this is not considered good publication ethic. There are many other publication ethics also, and there are guidebooks for uh, editors as to what are what com comprise publication ethics. There are ethical responsibilities of the editors, authors, referees, and even the publisher. Editor is supposed to be efficient and fair, ensure confidentiality. That means I cannot talk about your manuscript to your colleague who may copy your idea. Make a final decision on a sub sub submission in a reasonable amount of time, has to select referees in a fair manner, cannot assign all strict referees to one manuscript and all loose referees to another manuscript, and uh, act upon allegations of scientific uh, misconduct and deal with uh, appeals very uh, appropriately. Authors has to, has to, have to be honest, there should not be multiplication factor. If you see 10 cases, you cannot say I've seen 100 cases of this particular disease. You have to be very honest in terms of number, your data, and the data analysis. And you should give due recognition to published work of others, due acknowledgement to all the contributors. You cannot leave out a particular co-worker. If you have used a particular co-worker or a colleague to get a set of cases, you cannot leave him or her out, which often have happens. If a particular person leaves the hospital or a department or an institute, normally, you know, people move their jobs all the time. And if you're using 75% of his cases or 50% or even 10% of his cases, you cannot leave him out as a contributor. You have to include everybody who has contributed cases as a contributor or who has, whoever has part participated in the study. And you should not do salami publishing. This is called undue, undue fragmentation of work. You cannot say I'm pu publishing only one particular aspect of uh, this may work in one, this journal and I'll reserve complications for some other journal. That cannot happen. Or you can say just 40 cases published here and next year you publish 58 cases of the same disease somewhere else. So you cannot do that. right? And at one time you should not submit to more than two journals. And reviewers also have a responsibility of uh, not taking personal advantage of the data, not uh, getting biased with conflict of interest, and maintaining confidentiality, being objective, and being timely. So, if you have jumped any ethical, uh, uh, you know, uh, boundaries, then uh, there are very severe penalties. Finally, after this, once the manuscript is accepted, it goes into the production line. What does production involve? It involves copy setting, copy editing. That means that somebody in the journal's office go th goes through the manuscript and picks out spelling mistakes, which are inadvertent or language editing, sentence construction, paragraph, everything they look at, and then they type set it. 
once it is typeset it goes back to the author for what is called proofreading and it is generally time 24 to 48 to 72 hours is given for proofreading you proofread it send it back to the uh, journal's office and then you will get a final copy again if you are still not satisfied you can proofread even up to three or four times until you are satisfied that everything is perfect at that stage then it goes for printing now once it is printed is the game over game is just begun actually if you are in an academic world publishing a manuscript is just a game begun because you talk about what is called impact of your article unless you are cited you have no standing in an academic world just by the fact that you are published that's okay for a beginner you get a few publications on your cv but somebody at a particular level of career say suppose you want to get promoted as a professor then look at your h index they look at your g index these are all indices of the standing value of your past publications and for a journal it is the impact factor there are two uh, ways of uh, measuring the impact factor one is called scopus the second is called web of science and most of these have a common uh, pool of journals which they measure so impact factor is the oldest objective measure of the impact of a journal this was started in 1963 and uh, about 15 years ago h index and uh, other sort of indices have also come in it's a simple way of calculating impact factor is this total number of times the articles were cited during two previous years divided by the total number of citable articles in the journal during two previous years is a journal's impact factor that means that if your journal's articles have been submitted 100 times in the last two years and if you have published 50 articles in the last two years your impact factor is 2 for this year that means we take two previous years if it is 2020 you to take 2019 and 18 and the impact factor is released for 2020 now so that's it basically so a lot goes on behind the curtains curtains are not uh, opaque they are transparent at every stage you can track your manuscript and see where it is it's not a opaque curtain it's a transparent i would say translucent curtain you can see through it but lot goes on behind it and finally we come out with a 300 page or a 150 page which you call the uh, indian journal of ophthalmology thank you so much thank you sir for the excellent presentation it was beautifully covered now being young medical researchers we all have heard about pubmed but are we actually well versed with it so without much further ado i would like to invite our next speaker dr vivek gupta sir who will be throwing loud light on how to do a pubmed search over to you sir i am audible so basically uh, you know we we have all heard of pubmed and you know we all the first thing that we do when you know we are researching on a topic is we either do a google search or you know these days we do a pubmed search what is pubmed pubmed is a big database of articles it has over 25 million art articles which have been indexed into its database Uh, journals have been you know indexed in pubmed from all over the world articles from multiple languages journals of multiple languages are included in this database it is very user friendly often you get links to full text articles which are often free so you know once you have identified the right article you can go and access full text very often and you know everyone knows pubmed so you know that's why it's one of the most commonly used database engines for researching especially medical literature as of today approximately 7 and a half thousand journals get indexed in pubmed regularly and if we go back historically there are certain art journals which have been indexed even from the 19th century in pubmed that is only for a very selective few journals largely journals you know it started picking up in the 1940s 50s initially the database used to be made available to people on compact discs cds were available you know there would be a big set that would come into your library 
you would get the disk into the computer and search the database and you know change the disk search again but these days with internet you know all these things are just a click away and you know this is the url pubmed.ncbi.nlm.nih.gov you know it's a big link but typically we just go to google type pubmed and there the search engine is so the look of pubmed has changed very significantly in the last uh, six months or so uh, you know this is the new pubmed interface they still call it in beta and you know this is the screen that greets you as soon as you visit the pubmed site and just like google you have search pubmed written right in the middle just go ahead and the simplistic way would be to just type your words you know say bird in cataract surgery in that search box hit search and you would have your search results so even these search results this is the new interface of pubmed you know this is very different from the way it used to appear the results used to be on the left hand side and some of the filters would be on the right hand side but well this is nicer looking so few things uh, you know this is the very simple way of doing it you know you type a few words and you get the relevant results the a few new things have been added to pubmed now just like google if you start typing cat cataract so it will you know show you the possible words which match in case you have done a spelling mistake then the spelling will get auto corrected very often we are not interested in you know what all articles meet our search criteria we are only looking for a very specific article say pediatric cataract by cooker et al so we would just type the article and the authors and it would match the closest citation the closest article and show that to us and allow take allow us to go directly to that article as well on the left hand side in the current search interface you have various options for uh, sorting on the top hand right hand side you have the sorted by best match so the most relevant articles are visible to you first but you can choose the display options click there and sort by best match uh, most recent or by publication date so very often if you are interested in you know what happened recently was was there something new about say burden of cataract surgery in the last 2 years or 3 years you may want to sort the results in a descending order by publication date so that you have the latest results first you also have filters available to you on the left hand side the red boxes which i have uh, drawn here so in these you can choose to restrict your results only to full text or free full text articles to systematic reviews meta analysis published in the last one year you know and there are more filters also which are available to you earlier you had to click on next page and a new page would op open in the search results now you have a show more button at the bottom you click on this button so initially you you'll be getting 20 results show more you'll be getting 20 more results and the cycle will keep on repeating if you, there is an article that you are interested in it you know you click on the article the article opens and the abstract is visible to you now how i typically do it is i would do a control click on the title so that the article opens in a new tab of the browser it doesn't open in the tab that i am currently using how that helps is that you know my search results are there in one browser window my article is there in the next browser window i can read through the abstract if it is you know i find it useful i keep it open if i don't find it useful i close it if the article is open in front of you you also have the links to the full text here we have the link to walter's full clover journal site very often many of these articles you have the full text available in pubmed central so pubmed and pubmed central are kind of two sister sites you can say pubmed is the search engine pubmed central is where the full text articles are
kind of deposited and are available to you. So not every article goes into PubMed Central. Only few uh, journals submit their articles into PubMed Journal, PubMed Central, including the IJO. In the abstract, when you are viewing the abstract, you also have the option of viewing similar articles and cited by articles. Now this has the huge potential of helping you in your research because automatically PubMed will try to identify the most similar articles. Also, there is a great chance that articles which have cited this one, the one that you are seeing right now, they are also related, right? So you can go to similar or cited articles and uh, you know go ahead more further and further into your research. Now, very uh, some of the common issues that are faced, you know, if I just do a very broad search, I may get thousands of results. So how do I narrow it down? So one thing would be that, you know, instead of using general search terms, make more specific one. One example, low back pain, instead of just searching for back pain, we can increase the number of terms that we are using in our query. And again, the filtering options that I showed you on the left-hand side of the results, you can also use them. Very often there are very, you know, there may be too few results that you are getting. Now, that may be, you know, because your terms are very, very specific and, you know, the combination is uncommon. So really there are few articles, but I would actually take a step back and see, you know, maybe if I remove one or two terms from my query, do I get a broader set of results which I can use? Also, we must always try to search using alternate or synonym terms. Once you have the results in place, uh, what do you do with them, right? One is obviously you are going to read them and identify the relevant results. But as a best practice, you know, I always try to save the relevant articles into one of my citation softwares. I use Zotero most of the times. It is free, it is open source. I, with the click of a button in the browser, I can save the articles into my Zotero library and use those the same articles when I'm writing up a manuscript, when I'm citing, formatting. So it takes care of a lot of things for me few additional things, you know, especially if you're doing research for your thesis work. So you can create an email alert for the search. So what will happen is that PubMed will send you maybe a weekly or a daily or a monthly email with the updated articles that meet, that meet your criteria. You know, it's a good way to keep up to date with, uh, you know, topics that you're interested in. They may be related to your projects, to your thesis work, you know, or an topic of general interest to you. You could also create an account in PubMed these days and save your search results or create a collection within PubMed. So, you know, the next time you go to PubMed, you can just go to your results query and rerun the same query again, get updated results, see the citations that you have saved. And there are many other options which are available to you as well. So this is how it works with Zotero. So I have the article open on the left-hand side. So I have the article open here and within my browser here, uh, when I have installed Zotero on my system, I get a small link which says save to Zotero. I click on that and in the Zotero application, the article has become a part of my library. Now this article is available on my computer right now in Zotero and I can cite it in my manuscript. Always use a reference management software, always. This is a screenshot of email alerts. Uh, this I'm getting, you know, so I'm interested in refractive errors among young children. So I have created this complicated search which talks about prevalence or survey and blindness or visual impairment and ophthalmology. So uh, this is one, you know, on April 14th, I got these two updated matching articles which have appeared in PubMed in the, from the previous mail time. This is 
that said, we can create very, very complicated queries as well. You know, one example of the query you saw here in the search, you know, when you have, you see all these brackets, ands, ors. So let me show you how to do it easily. So if you're on the PubMed homepage, under the search box, bar you have the advanced search uh, you know text which is written the link is there if you click on that you get an interface which is something like this okay in this interface first of all you can choose you know i want to see say for example articles which have been authored only by say murthy at all so author murthy okay once I have, so I select the criteria, I say I want author to be Murthy. And then on the right hand side, I can add that criteria to my search. So I can say add with and. Then I can go ahead and say, I want to search for cataract, but it should only be in title and abstract. So from the drop down here, I'll select title abstract and the term I will add cataract and I'll say add with and. I want to say that I want articles which were only authored after 31st of January 2018. So I choose date create. I put the date. So I'll get two options, date from, date to. So from date, I'll put it as 31st January 2018. End date, I'll put today. And that's it. I again will say add with and. So as I keep adding my query parameters, so this query box below will keep on getting updated. And thereafter, I'll just hit search and that will give me results with these query parameters filtered. So here, you know, with all that query which I had created, I have got only eight results. So this is a good way if you want to restrict your, you know, search, you go into advanced search and, you know, create visually your uh, complex advanced query. As you can see, you can combine uh, searches using and and ors. The other secret to advanced permit searching are using tags. And one of my personal favorites is the title abstract tab. Okay, so, uh, you know, if I'm interested in cataract and burden, so there is very high likelihood that the article would include both these terms, either in the title or in the abstract. So I'll create a search cataract. After that, I will write within square brackets, T-I-A-B, title abstract. Then I will write and, and then I will write burden. Again, within square brackets, I will write T-I-A-B. So from the main PubMed window only, rather than going into that advanced builder kind of an interface, I can just write my query and get my results. So there are multiple tags which are available, author, journal, publication date, text words, and you can combine them with using and or not. And you can group the conditions using these round brackets or parentheses. So here I have a query in which the publication date, date, date of publication, DP, is from 1st January 2019 to 1st December 2019. And the articles must contain either the text word trachoma or trachoma in title or abstract. So by making use of and or and these round brackets, I have created an advanced query. You can also use wildcards. So cataract star would, you know, corneal uh, would match anything which is cataract followed by maybe a hyphen and a word. So it will expand your query that way. If there is a specific phrase that you want to search for, say corneal transplant, then you can put those, that phrase in double quotes. If you do not use double quotes, then the search would be corneal and transplant. Whereas if you use double quotes, it will be corneal transplant, the phrase that will be searched. You can also use the tag TW for exact uh, search by a phrase. 
there are a lot of resources available to you know, to use pubmed more effectively within the pubmed you have online training resources which are available quick tips tutorials webcasts videos etc even on the main pubmed home page you have the learn icon right there available to you which you know if you spend maybe 15 minutes 30 minutes on it Uh, sorry to interrupt you, sir. Uh, we are uh, running out of time. I requested to find the wind up for you. Yeah, yeah. So this is my last slide. So yeah, that's it. I think. Where you can do? You finish it. You take your time. Finish it. You have something uh, all more to say? You can say. Sir, so basically, I just wanted to say that if you are talking about PubMed search, one of the things that you would read is <coughs> uh, mesh headings. so which are medical subject headings which are basically uh, a vocabulary that pubmed uses internally which contains synonyms similar names etc so even if you have not used an exact name word in your search pubmed does a reasonably good job of finding alternates and even including those in the queries but you can always explore the students can always explore that mesh database to look for maybe more relevant words which are similar to the concept that you want you are interested in researching and use those terms as well in this search so uh, that's it sir this was uh, you know in a brief about uh, pubmed so i'll be happy to take questions yeah thank you vivek so thanks to all esteemed faculty for enlightening the students and and moral boosting them for preparing for the exams and giving them the tips which you are learn on lot of years of your hard work 30 40 years hard work of teaching experience sir dr mangal dogra sir first question is for you dr mangal dogra sir unmute yourself unmute yourself sir yes pg is asking you sir i realize that time is of importance and concise answer are way out to go as you told some of my teachers said said longer by answer sheet the more marks i will get <laughs> is it true, well i think uh, that's not true uh, i must say that uh, you see we have a very uh, uh, long experience of uh, going through all the notebooks from the biggest institution like uh, maybe all india institute rp center to a uh, smaller uh, medical colleges so uh, nobody is reading uh, the entire uh, you see question uh, the answer sheets so that's why i mentioned that if you are more concise you are bold you have drawn uh, a nice diagram and you have highlighted i think the chances are that you going to get good marks and you going to definitely pass but in case you write what you said uh, so many pages and fill up so many things and they may be not relevant and at times they are also at the expense of not uh, answering the questions later on properly so i would say i think what is required is that you be more concise and if you are concise and you look at those aspects of making drawings enumerating important points underlying them and labeling uh, i think uh, it, it goes a long way i totally you. agree with you sir my father has been a teacher as a, as a professor and a principal i used to see him checking the copies in 5 minutes he check one copy i asked him they are student has written 20 pages how can you check in 5 minutes he tell me i can judge from the in the 5 minutes what he has written there so if you have for size answer you have made a diagram flow charts diagram illustration that one page will be more than sufficient than your answer sheet of 10 but if you don't know there is a tip that dr dogra will not tell you if you do not know the question much question then you can write as many as paper sheet just to confuse the teacher you don't know the question that's 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 santosh one question for you Sir, you are asking question to Santosh sir, or I will ask. Dr. Santosh, one question for you: Anji. If there is data, if there is an article ready for publication, and then I find a mistake in it, as it is going to print, what should I do? You can correct it even up to the stage that it is printed. It can be corrected. 
and if after getting printed it if you find an error you can always uh, issue an error item which will be published in the next issue of the journal okay sir sir another question for you if my article uh, gets rejected once so how can i uh, can i resubmit it to same journal no to another journal yes not to the same journal and sir what is the difference between the paid journal and the igo because igo is also charging the fee which journal what is difference between the paid journals and the igo oh, okay IGO predatory journals yeah, yeah. there are predatory journals which uh, run by charging people for publication those are called publication fees but igo is mandated by the aius it is in the aius constitution that we should charge for color reproduction so if you have a color image that has to be charged by igo because igo runs on membership money igo does not have any income at all except by advertisements that the companies give and the membership money that uh, individual pays to aios igo has no source of income so for color printing igo charges money which is very modest in fact what we charge is charged in dollars for international journals we charge in rupees 70 times less <laughs> and so one more question for you that dr saiba can a prevalence study be published yes without without statistical analysis no nothing can be published without statistical analysis it has to be okay. duly okay. in what sense can be article be published without statistics case reports case report. of say ophthalmic images or a short case series of 5 6 cases santosh sir one more question from our special invitee srishti srishti can you unmute yourself and ask question to sir Uh, actually my question is for dr santosh sir yeah tell me so which one which would be which would be the best article for residents uh, budding ophthalmologists like me to start with to read or write right sir to write okay case report easy photo essays ophthalmic images very easy if you see something very good slit lamp image or a fundus image that you know if it's rare if you make a small story out of it absolutely fine something that involves a systemic disease if you find an ophthalmic condition in a patient who has a dermatological disease so that association is something that you can easily bring out and all your thesis can be published if it's done well and written well santosh how can we motivate the young generation to uh, is in the writing the in the journals and everything i think they should realize it themselves because it has value addition um, which is very significant you know if some are yeah, you have you have to tell them santosh do you have to tell them importance of the publication the in their journal when they are going for the fellowship absolutely it is not just fellowship it is even when they go for their first job people look at your cv you know especially in a academic institute or you can ask deepak you know it's very difficult to get a promotion in a government setting without uh, having articles similarly to get into a government job for that matter if you want to become a lecturer or a assistant uh, professor with after everything else that you have publications count a lot fellowship of course it counts a lot if you uh, apply for a, a kind of a travel grant you know apo travel grant your cv matters a lot so everything beyond residency cv matters a lot and the only way to add authentically to your cv is to publish Deepak, I will like you to add it because Deepak is the youngest person here who has getting promotion very fast. So he should, should tell him how he is getting the promotion, what he is doing for the general publication as well. Deepak, don't tell other things. Just the publication. <laughs> as sir is saying, as per the MCI rule two, publication is mandatory part because it is the part of our essentiality. If we become, if we didn't fill our essential criteria, then didn't we screened our for the interview so interview is the second step first step like practical practical is the second step first is your viva first is your theory of the dnb similar is first you have publication so that you can fulfill the screening criteria then you will be selected in any interview santosh sir one last question to you there is some question from neelam barma she wants to know how i become an editor member of editorial team well uh, it is see first is that if you have to be a member of the editorial team then you have to be a good reviewer reviewers are also assessed you know the way they how prompt they are with the reviews how rapidly they turn over a manuscript how accurate and uh, good their assessment is 
reviewers are assessed by uh, section editors so there is a assessment phase if you are a very good reviewer if you review 20 30 articles uh, in the 6 months or a year then you are your track in fact there are awards for good reviewers also in ijo every year 10 of the best reviewers get awards so those are up for inclusion into editorial board it's simple it's all based on merit mostly dr mena dr menakshi yeah menakshi ma'am is not there meanwhile we can take questions from the dr dogra sir dr khurana sir i can ask you then sorry yeah. sorry i am here i am here yeah ma'am yeah just yeah. muted yeah ma'am yeah. yeah. Ma'am, is there Mr. Dr. Vishesh Sadeva is asking, is there any software to practice the diagrams or application? Software to practice diagrams. Diagrams. Ah, uh, no, I'm not aware of. No, I'm not aware of. But there are many. Ah, uh, there are there are many. Ah, uh, uh, PowerPoints available for uh, free, which talk about uh, corneal diagrams and uh, retina diagrams. there's no point in using a software you're going to do the old fashioned way in the exam exam is going to be old fashioned way so you might as well just practice it that way not get used to something fancy and then you find you have color pencils in the exam i mean that is what i would think just to that diagram you have to practice yourself for the books and the from the uh, you, you, you yes how are you going to yes how are you going to take it to the exam i mean the exam hall there is no software this is not an online exam it's still a written exam so that's you have to practice with your coins and your bangles uh that's the way to do it and, but there there uh, there used to be some yeah. pharma companies used to give uh, a very nice stencil uh but uh, i have looked online and i've not been able to procure it if um i mean the entod could probably take it up i mean just as a just as a request i think it would be wonderful to have a stencil available with uh, showing a slit uh, diagram of the uh, uh, you know uh, uh, cross section of the cornea and the anterior segment and uh, also uh, circles like this to draw and a cer nice circle for the fundus i think that would be very nice for the students to have sir our special invite any question by you special invite any question to you to any faculty by you dr sneha can ask saloni hey aap uh am i audible yes 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 you are audible good evening uh i'd like yes, to ask are. uh dr minakshi uh ma'am sometimes during the practicals no matter what we do sometimes we have a bad downfall and the confidence of the student uh just you know you lose it and then the next few questions you even though you know the answer it becomes a little difficult to get back up So, how do you suggest uh, we deal with such a situation? Actually, I had a similar question for Doctor Dogra as well. Um, how to basically how to approach the never heard questions in theory and in practicals? Okay, Doctor Dogra, you want to answer first? Do you want to answer first? <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, you may encounter such a situation once in a while, especially. when something uh, which has come up new or is something in the recent advances where perhaps it has been missed so and there i think that's why i said you have to be doing all your questions right uh, like if you start with the best questions and you go to that one last you are not going to if you suppose you get oct and geography and you don't know a b c d of that don't write something which is uh, totally off the track so that is not a good thing but what you can do is that you can keep such a situation to the end and if you don't know anything then it's better to leave it but otherwise most of the time uh, i think even if you have a little bit of a idea what we have seen and i have experienced that in the last couple of questions you might have just about 3 4 5 lines written there but if they are relevant uh, we tend to give some marks of course if it is totally relevant then the one is going to get zero for that particular question so that can happen yes yes minakshi so uh, coming to uh, practicals couple of things so one is uh, i'll give you an example uh, for example if you were asked about uh, my earlier case that i presented was a ptosis and if you're asked why do you want to examine the pupils and just 
Imagine that you're completely blanked out of the word honor syndrome. It's just not coming to you. So sometimes it is nice to, uh, and, and already one or two questions you have not answered, perhaps. So it's a good idea sometimes to steer the examiner slightly towards something that you know. For example, you can always answer saying, uh, in ocular motor policy, um, you know, it's important because we divide it into pupil sparing and pupil involving. And then a lot of examiners love these, uh, these areas to question. And so they can just then follow that path. And you may have es escaped another, uh, you know, bottomless pit that perhaps you were dropping into. That is one. The second thing, like I again told you, you know, long silences, uh, you know, and fumbling around sometimes does not help you because see, everybody has allotted a certain time by which you have to finish uh, the viva. So if you are totally clueless, if you come to your ophthalmology question and you're just clueless, just say, sorry, I'm, I'm not sure. Go on to an, something else where at least you'll be able to answer. I think that is a, a, that's, that's a good way to uh, make things go towards you. Thank you. As she has rightly said, that whenever you do not do any answer, try to keep the contention of the, uh, your uh, teacher to the other direction, but never lose your confidence. You should mentally prepare that some questions will be asked which you don't know. So one thing, good thing is keep smiling. Do not look, show the examiner that you are losing your confidence. You don't know anything. Just keep smiling. Though she will, or she will ask you another question because always teacher want to see your confidence. They know that you know, you can't know each and everything. Even we can't know everything. So it is not to lose the confidence. Just keep confidence yourself and keep smiling and wait for the another question to come. Next is Dr. Tina. Another, you can ask your question. Any other? Sir, sir, am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Sir, uh, I would like to ask a question to Kurana, sir. So what are the aspects and questions should a resident be familiarized in biostatistics? Like in DNB, we regularly get questions on biostatistics. Dr. Kurana, sir. So basically, yes, sir. Basically, all basic statistics we should know. Because we are doing many thesis, we become well conversant with this. So sometimes to practical examination, this may be asked, or sometimes there may be small note on that. So basic, you should know all what is p-value, what is the t-test, what is fair t-test, what is Pearson coefficient. Common thing that at least you must do. Detail, it may not be much that if you don't know, but common statistics must be known. What is incidence, what is prevalence? Sometimes you are not able to even differentiate what is incidence, what is prevalence then it becomes very difficult in the examination. And I also want to say something about the publication to the residents. And uh, here I would like to tell them that the thesis is most important. If they really work during the thesis, they can get two to three pub good publication from the thesis. And then they have a good moral boost up. Here I will also like to say, sometimes I always say it is just like a marriage. The teacher as well as the students, if they both are proactive, then you get very good article and from the one thesis. My first the article was from my own thesis that was in experimental eye research immediately in a year of my passing. Day. So it made a lot of difference in my perspectives. Similarly, my first PG was allotted to me. We had four articles from his thesis. One was in the International Journal. So thesis is a time when if you really devote time, you review the article literature also, then you learn the statistics also. So this should not be taken lightly, basically. But some students think they don't want thesis is of no use later on. But I will say that they must concentrate on thesis and work hard on thesis. And this will pay them a long in academically in their life. This is what I want. Sir, one question is for Dr. Ajat, sir. Ajat, sir, kindly unmute yourself. Yes, yes. Sir, my question is to Dr. Ajat, sir. I am the third year resident. And if sir is my examiner and I have allotted a case of ROP, how can I face him? Uh, see, um, <laughs> in fact, I was going to say that there are different kind of examiners. Everybody has talked about the student. Look, this is what students should do. This is what he should not do, you know. Picking up the thread from the discussion, you know. And uh, as uh, one of the students said that I, when I appear in the exam, in the theory, uh, sorry, in the viva exam, and the examiner is asking a question, and I do not know, and then what should I do? 
and then somebody said that you should divert the examiner. It's not easy to divert the examiner. <laughs> Everything depends on what kind of examiner is there. Sometimes there are normal examiners. When the normal examiners are there, like if I'm there, if I have to ask question on ROP, I will ask the basic things. I will not ask you whether anti vegf is used or not. I will ask you what is recovery of immaturity, whether it is a developmental disease, whether it is an anomaly of the vessels, where there is prematurity there. I mean, simple questions, you know. I don't want you to know everything about retinopathy of prematurity, especially on the, the, you know, on the, on the side of management. But I definitely want you to know what the disease is and how you will diagnose. You may not be able to diagnose, but at least tell what are the points in the diagnosis. So it depends on the examiner. No, some good examiners are there, normal examiners like me. If I go there, my intention is not to fail the student. I will never fail the until and unless the student is herself or himself not capable to pass. This is my first motto. So that is what you know it is the it is the examiner also which makes a lot of difference. If somebody is fumbling, somebody is stumbling, what I do, I say you or somebody is nervous, you go and sit there, you go there for 15 minutes, and in the meantime, I'll examine the another student and then you come back to me. So that should be the attitude. The idea should be to examine the student, that the student has a knowledge on the subject so that he can practice it outside. That should be the idea. And here I would also like to say there are some cranky examiners. The basic idea of examination is to test the knowledge of the student, not that the examiner should show his own knowledge. His knowledge he has his own platform where he can share it with his own colleagues. So this, 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 these are the problem. This, this problem is there. The student should be examined to his knowledge, which is required at that point of time. This happens also in the presentations. When we go for the presentation, the presentation should be only to the subject and what level of audience is there. If I have a PG student, I'll talk about the PG level. If I have my colleagues with me, I will talk about the research and the recent developments. So all these factors are very important. And if I have to conclude this session, this was a wonderful session, but I, I would still like that little pruning is needed in this session so that we are more you know, objectivized. Because if we are more obje objectivized, the students will learn more. You know, I was thinking when he was talking about the PubMed, I was thinking, what is the use of PubMed for these postgraduate students? But there is a use. There is a use. And what is the use? The use is when you go for your thesis uh, presentation or when you go for your protocol presentation. When you go for your protocol presentation, at that time, you have to find out the articles which have been done on a particular topic where you have to start your thesis. There, PubMed will come into your role. And therefore, it is very important. Why journal is important? When you finish your paper thesis, then you must present, you must publish your paper. As Santosh told you about the different, you know, aspects of publishing an article in the journal, that's very important. And of course, the other aspects have already been, uh, you know, presented to you. So, uh, you know, I mean, for the students, again, I will tell you one thing. If you have done a good residency pro, uh, training, like, you know, when I entered in RP Center, I was told that this is a three years rigorous imprisonment. I was told that this is a three years rigorous imprisonment. And truly, it is a three years rigorous imprisonment. If you have done well, if you have, you know, seen cases, if you have worked in hard, in rewards, if you have attended all the lectures, there is no reason, no examiner in the world will fail you and you will you know, come out with the flying colors. So that's what I wanted to tell you. And uh, I think, thank you very much for this wonderful session. And we hope to do still more. I don't know, uh, you know, we'll, we'll do something more. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any question to Dr. Vivek? Any special invite, Dr. Have you any question? Dr. Dogra, sir? Yes, please. Dr. <laughs> Dogra, sir? Yes. Sir, if 
your views about this webinar what you want to say to them and last the motivating to move them, to move boost their moral and mood of the pg student going to appear in the exam well i think uh, before we say goodbye i think it's a great uh, uh, idea to have uh, a forum like this where uh, you see uh, all our residents whether they are doing uh, dnb mdms or do uh, they'll uh, have their queries also sort of clarified and know basically that what way we should be proceeding uh, especially with their studies it's not only uh, how they study and and what they should study how they should prioritize as well as in the long run what uh, professor azad already said even dr kurana said and uh, it's not only that we have to sort of just cram everything i think if we are more practical we work hard as musa azad said that you utilize those three years and if you have a problem that uh, facilities are not available for good teaching so these are a forum you look at the forum which is created by santosh i i think he has created a great forum which is so popular that he gets more people uh, in, in his pg course and they get benefited and we uh, are surprised that they are even going from uh, like institution like ours they feel that they get more benefit even uh, uh, as far as uh, their studies are concerned so we need to be more doing more for education medical education and that is a setback at this time i am sure professor azad purana would agree with me and so all of you that at this time somehow we are not interested in teaching we are interested in other things and that's a sad part and it's becoming more and more like that and that's not a good thing for our country we need to train these teachers that is what i feel we need to train from peripheral colleges because they have no idea they have no exposure for what is being done in the present they sometimes they don't have even have seen a fake machine and they have not seen a fake machine so what what do you do everybody talks about fake so those are the issues i think we need to address at length what to talk of other things which are, we do like octs and oct and geographies and others i have myself seen that when i went to a very good college their professor hods they have never taken out that indirect ophthalmoscope so they were, were not uh, giving that there was one available but inside somewhere so that is what we will have to change our mindset train people more and uh, we have to tell our pgs we have to change up their perception also that they should get trained how they'll get trained better i'll uh, just end with that like i think it's a good model in rp center like in our institution we tell them to buy everything including in direct of thermoscope a streak a uh, trial set everything so they, if they have their own even in the peripheral center they'll do it they'll learn it they'll force their teacher to do the same so these are some of the things i can go on and on <laughs> because there are a lot of problems with the medical education in our country thank you thank you sir dr manakshi ma'am you have been associated with teaching so long you have seen lot of ups and down in the students life during examination your last comment to moral boosting of the students and to guide them dr manakshi ma'am and dr prana sir i wanted to say uh, uh, first of all i wanted to congratulate uh, both of you and your team for a fantastic forum where uh, you are you have uh, helped the pgs by offering the nuts and bolts of really how to go about important aspects of their residency right from dr kurana's as how to be a, a model resident to theory to practical exams to pubmed search which is an integral part of anything you do today uh if you want to practice evidence based uh, ophthalmology and a wonderful uh, talk by santosh and you i think you've done a exemplary job of uh, putting uh, this program together so congratulations to both of you but i want to end on an optimistic note saying that i have been associated with the arc of the uh, all india ophthalmological society for almost 5 years now and we have done the teachers in ophthalmology program as a pre conference uh, program every year year after year 
And I can say that there is a definite increase in the cadre of young teachers, people who want to learn how to be good teachers in all aspects of teaching, not just lecture skills, but how to be a good surgical teacher, how to give feedback to their students. So many aspects, I find there is interest now amongst the youngsters. So I, I think uh, good times are ahead in medical education. And my appeal to all the postgraduates uh, is this, and I say this every time, that when you finish your post-graduation and wherever you join, before you jump into private practice, if you can devote the first four to five years to a teaching institution and give back what you have learned, I think you will do a great service to improve the ophthalmic education in our country. Uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Dr. Kran, sir. Yes, sir. Deepak, so I will want to start from where Madam has ended with the optimistic approach. Because what I have seen over the years that now the students are becoming proactive, undoubtedly. And they have their own gadgets like indirect ophthalmoscope, gonioscopes, which are not even available sometimes in the government medical colleges. And these teaching forums, like as Dr. Dogra has already mentioned, by this PG forum and Dr. Santosh, DOS, and even RP Center, so many the PG forums are available for them to get updated. And I must appreciate that our residents nowadays are more techno digitally more sound than us even. They make slides for us, they make videos for us. So this is very good and their documentation is becoming much better than what we have in our times. So with this, I will like it's an optimistic approach and undoubtedly there is some problem somewhere in the sense that the big institutions and they have so much advances and even the examiner, they expect so much. But I will still like to tell to the students that they should stick to the basics. Basics should be very clear in these three years. And if they don't tell the basics only, then the examiner is annoyed. But if they don't take the advanced advances, they, nobody will fail. But if you tell, definitely you are going to get better marks. That's there. But basics should be very, very clear. That is the most important. And all these three years, they should make a schedule to read daily. They should see the cases and study them in the books. What is it? And discuss next day with the seniors. If, what was the problem in this case? So I think the future is rather very good. We, there's a lot of exposure to the students everywhere. Google is also full of that. So many videos. We never saw a video of the surgery. And now you can just see the video and you can start doing yourself also. So a lot of avenues are there for the students. They should be very happy and lucky. But at the same time, they have very tough competition also. <laughs> so thank you very much for asking me to speak. Thank and it sir. was a wonderful webinar. Thank you, sir. Thank Definitely you. very useful for the students. Thank you, sir. Our efforts of making this PG forum, Deepak May was the same. We are not the alternative to the books, but we are the guide. We are bound to become the guide to the students, where we can guide them what is right for them, what is wrong for them, where they should approach, or how they should approach. The aim of this platform is the same. Dr. Santosh, you have a vast experience of the association with both graduates. What do you like to guide them? Sir, sir is not there. Sir has moved for some urgent work. I think Dr. Sir, make your views on this webinar. Uh, sir, I think these webinars are excellent and these are a good way to reach out a large number of students across the country. And uh, it's a win-win situation for everyone. And you know, kudos to you and to the team for taking the lead and initiating them. Thank you. Dogra sir, all our, our PGs you have seen here are the first time on the web series. So what you can say about their confidence and the way of conducting these webinars? They all are the PG uh, such as uh, the they they the the national platform <laughs> except Saloni <laughs> done with us. I think they did so well and very confident and uh, even uh, the way uh, the whole uh, webinar was conducted and their participation. And they were very, very, uh, all the time, uh, active as well as asked questions. So I think that is what we uh, feel should be uh, uh, expected from all the residents. And uh, that was great. Absolutely. 
and we expect them to, do, to go in the exam with the same confidence. Yes, and they should go with the confidence, with a cool mind, with full relaxation. And uh, the examiners or the exam is not something which is end of everything. It is just the beginning. So you have to be just cool and you go there as already emphasized by everybody. You're going to go through that very smoothly. So good luck to all of you. Deepak, Deepak, thank you. Sir. Now uh, Saloni can give the vote of Saloni, you conclude the, the session. You can invite uh, if anyone wish to say anything about the PG forum. Any of the special attendees want to say any, anything about the session? Anyone having any question or wish to I say just, anything? I just like to thank uh, PG exam forum for this opportunity and uh, like everyone said the stalwarts of Ofthal were here but I'd rather call them our role models and um, it's very it's a great opportunity to get to interact with you on such a personal though virtual but personal level thank you uh, anyone else would like to say something I would like to thank Dr. Deepak sir for giving me this opportunity at, uh, at this such an early stage of my career to be a part of uh, this webinar and uh, to interact personally with all the renowned faculties all over the country. And I think PG Forum is an excellent platform for all budding of talent like me to learn and to dash ma maximum information and to become like our uh, renowned faculty all over the country. Uh, before I wind up, I would like to request you all to go to this AIOS online survey. It is an interesting survey on post-lockdown challenges to an optimal surgeon, and it would hardly take five minutes to kindly go through it and fill it. And to join our PG examination forum group, uh, you can message your name and college name to Dr. Deepak Misha sir. The number is being displayed on the screen. It's 94153603. And I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to our chairperson, sir, moderators, and prolific speakers. We all had the privilege to, to learn from you through this virtual platform. I would also like to thank my fellow special attendees for making the session so interactive and to enjoy our pharmaceuticals for logistics. Last but not the least, I thank you all residents and attendees of this webinar to make it a success. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.